So I promise you that my original goal was to make this video short and sweet, and uh, <laughs> that's just not possible with me. Everything is overly detailed. So as this video goes along, there's gonna be tons of links below to blog posts, to Facebook posts, Instagram posts, emails, all kinds of things, guides, all kinds of other stuff that I've written because there's just so much nuance here in Florida in the winter that I wanna cover all my bases. But I do wanna keep this video short and sweet, so let's get into knocking out some diseases. But first, let me show you how terrible glyphosate works when it's cold outside. So you guys will remember the last video I made like 10 days ago maybe. I had not put up my Christmas lights yet and I was spraying weeds all up underneath here. Now it's been really cold and when I say really cold I mean into the 60s at night which is not cold to you guys up north but what I'm getting at is it's cold for these weeds meaning they're not moving. The weeds are not actively growing and if the weeds are not actively growing it's really difficult for the glyphosate to work its way down through and kill it. Look. Still alive, hairy bittercress. Now for sure it's struggling though, and here's a couple still photos, but that's just what happens. Now, the other thing is that's in the shade, and so we need sunlight, right? Sunlight is so important. Let me show you weeds sprayed with the exact same mix that have been out in the bright sunlight. See, there you go. That is a hammer. It's just that sunlight stimulated these to grow, which also stimulated the chemical to move through the plant and kill it. Now I'll just tell you that glyphosate works slowly, even in the best of conditions. Everybody thinks glyphosate's so awesome, and it is because it kills a lot of stuff, but it actually is one of the slower weed killers that, uh, that I've ever actually used. So anyway, don't respray. That's the key. All right, let's get into today's video now. I told you it was gonna be complicated, didn't I? Can you see that uh, little off coloring in there? I took a picture earlier this morning when it was foggy. Anyway, that is a little bit of large patch starting to work its way into the lawn there. I've done a lot of videos about this, and again, there'll be tons of those linked below. But uh, large patch is not something I've had too much problem with over the winter in the last couple years, except for in small spots like this. And I had actually planned not to treat it this year because of that, because those small spots don't really bother me. They just grow back out. But uh, I've actually got another spot in the zoysia, actually a very large area in the zoysia that uh, I want to address also. So here's the zoysia. I'll show you some still pictures again that will show the large patch a little bit better. But this area here, was basically underwater almost all summer and that is actually where all the diseases manifest too because that's how these diseases travel is they just follow the water flow. So as the water was sitting here, this area was just wet, wet, wet all the time and you can see where the water flowed and it took the spores with it and now the diseases manifest. So there is good news in this and that is in that when I do go to put drainage in here because that's what I'm gonna do in, the, in like January or February, when I go to put drainage in, I know where the water was standing because it's basically showing me. So that's one of the helpful things here if there's like a silver lining to having your zoysia diseased. So my plan this year was to just let the disease do what it was going to do, just fertilize my way through it. These lawns grow out. A um, whole lot of stuff about natural growth regulators because of the weather and the time of the year. Again, addressed below in a blog post. But my idea was I was just going to kind of let it go. But because the zoysia is so bad over there and I do want to handle that. I might as well go ahead and handle these couple small spots here at the same time. And this will give me a chance to um, put into practice what, what is known as integrated pest management or IPM. So in the past, when we were going to treat for disease, what I would do is I would blanket the entire lawn with, you know, two types of disease control. We've talked about that before, but I would do the entire lawn. In the case of integrated pest management, what we're going to do is we're going to attack the disease but we're gonna to try to do it in a minimalistic way. And what I mean by that is, because the entire lawn is not being threatened at all really here with a large patch, I'm gonna to try to control it locally and I'm going to only apply a small amount of chemical and I'm only going to apply it in the areas where I actually have the disease present and just a few feet out. And the idea will be hopefully I can just use a small amount of chemical there clear that up and everything else will get away scot-free. So that's how I'm applying integrated pest management. The idea of it is essentially is you don't apply any type of a hard or chemical control unless 
the uh, disease in this case is having a negative impact on your primary crop. My primary crop is turf grass and I'm willing to live with a little bit of disease here and there so I don't apply the hard control. And that's integrated pest management. However, because it has now started to affect my crop in a negative way over there on my zoysia, I am going to now employ that control, but instead of blanketing it everywhere, integrated pest management would say, let's try to spot spray. Let's try to contain the spray, the, the amount of chemical we use, to only the spots where it's most needed. That's integrated pest management, and that's how I'm spraying and praying today. All right, so you guys have seen this before. Standard bulletproof strategy. I've got a Zoxystrobin right here, group 11, and then I have some propiconazole right here, group 3, I think, but either way, those two in combination. I'm also going to spike in some Humic 12, which for those of you with postage stamp lawns, we now have quartz available. If you are a consumer who likes to spend a ton of money and you want something that for sure is going to wipe out the large patch. ProStar works great. This is a group seven fungicide, so you could do a ProStar Azoxy and you'd be in really good shape. I'm gonna stick with the Everyman though, and we're doing the Azoxy and the Propiconazole. And again, spike in some humic because I like a little goodness to go down into the soil every time I spray. All right, so I mixed up a gallon because I have just under a thousand square feet to spray. So that's the idea, right? I'm not trying to hold on to this or anything. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead just now and I'm gonna spray the areas that I can see they're affected and I'm gonna spray a couple two tree feet outside of that is like a little bit of a buffer zone. We're gonna be in a pool. We're gonna be in a clubhouse. We're gonna be all over that shuffleboard court. And I dare you to keep me out. Hey, one more real quick thing, y'all. I realize there's a bunch of you guys that are, you know, in South Texas or across the Gulf Coast that your lawns are not dormant yet, and especially if you have St. Augustine grass, you are also seeing large patch infesting, and you're wondering, are these treatments right for you? So a general rule of thumb is, is that if you're still able to enjoy the mow, then it's certainly fine to let those fungicides flow, meaning if you're mowing at least every 12 to 14 days, that means I would say your grass is still actively growing, then yes, you are eligible to go ahead and treat for the fungus. However, if you've gone dormant and you're not mowing anymore, then no, I would let it go. But I would remember for next season, heading into the fall, that you did have a problem and you may want to pre-treat and get ahead of it. People will ask if you should water this in. The answer is no, just let it go. You got irrigation that runs every couple, two, three days or so, that's fine. Just let that hit it, but don't water it in right away. Give it at least a good 24 hours or so to just kind of dry and soak in and sit there. 48 if you can would be a little bit better. So the final question is people will ask, well, can I still fertilize? And the answer is down here in Florida in the winter when we're getting a natural growth regulator from short days, overcast days, foggy days, as well as from cooler temperatures, the answer is yes, feed this beast. The last thing you want to do when your lawn is diseased and trying to fight the disease is to stop giving it the nutrients it needs to support itself. I got a blog post below that addresses this a little bit more because all you have to do is follow the logic and you'll see, yes, you need to keep throwing down. Throw her down! Let's hope for the best! So there you go, guys. That's all I got for you today, talking a little bit about the disease that we're seeing here in Florida. If you're wanting a little bit more information about Florida lawn care, especially here in the winter, I have a specific email list you can sign up for. I'll link that below for you. Every single week, I send out tips right here from Bradenton talking about what's going on in Florida lawns and how you can get ahead of the weather and other things that will be upcoming. So thank you so much for watching. Hope you guys have a great rest of your week and a Merry Christmas and holiday season, and I'll see you in the lawn.